Welcome to Walking the Half Torah. I'm Tyler Warren, and this is Torah Portion, Masse. This week's Torah Portion is Numbers 331 through 36, 13. Our Half Torah this week is Jeremiah 2, 4 through 28 and 3, 4. Masse means journeys or stages, as in the opening line of our Torah Portion that reads, These are the stages of the people of Israel when they went out of the land of Egypt by their companies under the leadership of Moses and Aaron. Numbers 33, verse 1. This week, our Torah portion will be part two of a double portion when read in non-leap years, read with Torah portion Matot. This portion will also close the fourth book of the Torah, Bamidbar, or Numbers. Our Torah portion this week will recount Israel's wilderness encampments, cover the boundaries of the Promised Land, the Levitical cities and the cities of refuge, the rules regarding murder and manslaughter, and ends with the instructions regarding tribal intermarriage. Our half Torah this week will continue in Jeremiah in the three theme of the three weeks, or between the straits. So let's begin by reviewing this week's portion. They set out from Ramesses in the first month, on the fifteenth day of the first month. On the day after the Passover, The people of Israel went out triumphantly in the sight of all the Egyptians, while the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn, whom yod heh had struck down among them. On their gods also yod heh executed judgments. Numbers 33, verses 3 through 4. All the stages listed here in chapter 33, beginning with the exodus of Egypt, cover all the journeys and encampments of Israel in the wilderness up to the point where we're currently in the story which is in the plains of Moab, sitting at the doorstep of the Promised Land. There are a total of 42 stages in the wilderness journey. This correlates to the generations of the Messiah as listed in Matthew chapter 1, which begin with Abraham and end with Yeshua, which are 42 generations. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation of Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation of Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Matthew 1, 17. Remember that Christ is from the Greek Christos, which means anointed one or one anointed with oil. This is a direct translation of the Hebrew, Mashiach, which also means anointed one or one anointed with oil. So the Christ and Hamashiach are the same exact expressions, just in two different languages. And Messiah, of course, is the same expression in Aramaic. Now, Matthew breaks the 42 generations of Messiah into three 14-generational periods. The first generational period being from Abraham to King David. And the 14th stop in the wilderness was at the doorstep of the Promised Land the first time, where they had the failure of the ten spies. Here we see a picture of promise. Both King David, being that model king of the Messiah had that promise of eternity. And being at the doorstep of the, of the promised land the first time has that promise that they could have gone in and been into their rest. But that didn't happen. So the next generational period is from King David to the Babylonian exile. And of course, exile is about the farthest away that you want to be as far as the goal. The goal is to be in the land, not out. And the 28th encampment would put Israel at the farthest point spiritually from the promised land, the farthest away from their goal. Here we see a picture of the punishment for abandoning the Creator. And then finally, the last 14 generations lead us from the Babylonian exile to Yeshua, the long-awaited Messiah. And the 42nd stop in the wilderness again puts us at the doorstep of the promised land. This again is the message of hope and promise. Adonai then commands Israel to drive out the inhabitants of the land and destroy all their idols and high places, and then warns them, But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then those of them whom you let remain shall be as barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides and they shall trouble you in the land where you dwell. And I will do to you as I thought to do to them. Numbers 33, 55, and 56. The commentary makes a sober note on this passage. 
It says, no human ruler has the right to decree that an entire population is to be exterminated or exiled. But God revealed that the Canaanite presence was incompatible with both the land's holiness and Israel's mission on earth. History is the most conclusive proof of this, for the fact was that Israel could not bring themselves to eliminate all the Canaanites, with the result that Israel was drawn to idolatry and debauchery and were in turn periodically oppressed and finally exiled. Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, can only be securely kept through righteousness and covenant loyalty to the Creator. Chapter 34 lays out the boundaries of the land and the tribal leaders who would apportion land. Chapter 35 begins with appointing 42 Levitical cities that are to be established in the land, which will be scattered throughout the 12 tribes. Six Levitical cities of refuge are also to be established outside of the 42 Levitical cities. This would ensure the Torah scholars and teachers would be spread across the land. The cities of refuge were set up for the manslayer to escape the avenger of blood. It goes on to discuss unintentional murder, what we refer to as manslaughter, and intentional murder. If a man is killed by another man, the deceased family can legally avenge the blood of their slain family member unless the killer goes to a city of refuge. There, the assembly will judge the case between the killer and the avenger of blood. If the killing was judged to be intentional, which would require at least two credible witnesses, the killer would be executed by the avenger of blood. But if the judgment was manslaughter or lacked witnesses, the killer had to stay in the city of refuge until the death of the Kohen Gadol that lived during that time. If the killer left the city of refuge before the death of the high priest, the blood avenger was, would be justified in taking the killer's life. There's a lot more nuance to this that we covered in the Walking the Torah portions on this episode. Moreover, you shall accept no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall be put to death, and you shall accept no ransom for him who has fled to his city of refuge, that he may not return to dwell in the land before the death of the high priest. Numbers 35, 31, and 32. You cannot buy your way out of the punishment for shedding innocent blood, even if it wasn't intentional. You shall not pollute the land in which you live, for blood pollutes the land, and no atonement can be made for the land for the blood that is shed in it, except by the blood of the one who shed it. You shall not defile the land in which you live, in the midst of which I dwell, for I, Yotevave, dwell in the midst of the people of Israel. Numbers 35, 33, and 34. Our portion and the book of Numbers ends with a challenge brought to Moses regarding the daughters of Zeholophod and the command to give them land inheritance in Eretz Israel. The issue is, if the daughters inherit the land but end up marrying outside of their tribes, then in the Yovel or Jubilee year, that land would then go back to the tribe of their husband that they married, and the land would be taken from the land of their father. Adonai then commanded that if the daughters do inherit land, that they must marry within their tribes in order to keep the land within the original inheritance. And the daughters of Zeholophod did as Adonai had commanded. The portion and the book ends with, these are the commandments and the rules that yod heh commanded through Moses to the people of Israel in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho. Numbers 36, 13. As we have finished reading a book of the Torah, we proclaim, Kazach, Kazach, Venik Kazach. Be strong, be strong, and may we be strengthened. This brings us to our half Torah this week and back to Jeremiah. This is the second of three half Torah portions that are thematically connected to the three weeks or between the straits. This three week period is part of a broader historic and prophetic picture. We get this from 
the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah 8, 18 and 19, which reads, And the word of yod heh vav of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says yod heh vav of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah, seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful feasts, therefore love, truth, and peace. The basis for these fast days that will be turned into feast days chronologically begin actually with the fast of the tenth month. This is the fast that happens on the tenth day of the tenth month, which is Tevet. Remember that the original pattern of the Babylonian exile, a judgment against Israel for abandoning the Holy One. So the tenth of Tevet is when the Babylonian army of Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to the walls of Jerusalem. This cut off supplies both in and out of the holy city. So the fast of the tenth month is remembering the first shoe dropping in that judgment. Holy See Elwind also noticed that the naming of COVID-19, the worldwide pandemic of 2020, was also officially declared by the World Health Organization, the WHO, on this same day, the 10th of Tibet. We don't know exactly what this means, but it's always wise to take note when world events coincide with the dates of biblical prophecy. Next, in Zechariah's prophecy, we get the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth month. This is the three weeks or between the straits. The fast of the fourth month is the 17th of Tammuz when the daily sacrifices were halted. And near this time, the walls of Jerusalem were breached by the Babylonian army. And the actual breach of the protective walls also happened on this date by the Roman army during the second temple period and during the first century. Three weeks later, we get to the fast of the fifth month, which is the ninth of Av. This is when the first temple was destroyed by Babylon in 586 or 587 BC, and the second temple was destroyed by Rome in 70 AD. And finally, the fast of the seventh month is known as the fast of Gedalia, which is observed on the third of Tishri, or the seventh month. Gedalia was appointed to be the governor over Jerusalem that was to care for the remnant of Israel that was left after the Babylonian exile. Gedalia, unfortunately, was assassinated by Ishmael on the Feast of Trumpets, and this action eventually drove the remnant of Judah out of the land and back to Egypt. You can read about this in 2 Kings 25 and in Jeremiah 40 and 41. So this is the basis of the four fast days that will become seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. With that background, let's jump back into our half Torah and to the book of Jeremiah, picking up where we left off last portion. Hear the word of yod heh O house of Jacob, and all the clans of the house of Israel. Thus says yod heh What wrong did your fathers find in me, that they went afar from me, and went after worthlessness, and became worthless? They did not say, Where is yod heh who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness, in the land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that none passes through, where no man dwells? And I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good things. But when you came in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, Where is yod heh Those who handle the law did not know me. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Jeremiah 2, 4-8 through Israel's actions from the people and its leaders show the ingratitude towards the Holy One who brought them out of slavery through a barren desert and into a wonderful land flowing with milk and honey. Idolatry not only is an affront to Adonai, but it also pollutes the physical land itself. Therefore, I still contend with you, declares yod heh and with your children's children I will contend. For cross to the coast of Cyprus and see, or send to Kadar and examine with care. See if there has been such a thing. 
Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares yod heh for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Verses 9-13 through 13. Israel has exchanged Adonai for futility. He always contends with Israel, giving her chance after chance, before he must finally bring discipline. He chastises them, stating that even the pagan nations remain loyal to their false gods. And the two evils spoken of here are the breaking of the first two commandments. The first being that I am yod heh vav -Hey, your Elohim, the one and only. And two is do not worship other gods besides me. He compares abandoning Adonai to abandoning springs of fresh living water and instead relying on man-made cisterns to store stagnant water and broken leaking cisterns at that. Is, is Israel a slave? Is he a home-born servant? Why then has he become prey? The lions have roared against him. They have roared loudly. They have made his land a waste. His cities are in ruins without inhabitant. Moreover, the men of Memphis and Taphanes have shaved the crown of your head. Have you not brought this upon yourself for, for, by forsaking yod heh your God? When he led you in the way, and now, what do you gain by going to Egypt to drink the waters of the Nile? Or what do you gain by going to Assyria to drink the waters of the Euphrates? Your evil will chastise you, and your apostasy will reprove you. Know and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake yod heh your God. The fear of me is not in you, declares the Lord yod heh of hosts. Verses 14 through 19. Remember that the fear or reverence of Adonai is the beginning of all wisdom. Judah was trying to protect itself by making alliances with Egypt and Assyria instead of turning back to Adonai, the rock, their redeemer, their warrior. For long ago I broke your yoke and burst your bonds, but you said, I will not serve. Yes, on every high hill and un under every green tree you bowed down like a whore. Yet I planted you a choice vine, holy a pure seed. How then have you turned to de degenerate and become a wild vine? Though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stains of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord yod heh How can you say, I am not unclean? I have not gone after the Baals. Look at your way in the valley. Know what you have done. A restless young camel running here and there, a wild donkey used in the wilderness, in her heat sniffing the wind. Who can restrain her lust? None who seek her need to weary themselves. In her month they will find her. Verses 20-24 Adonai released Israel from slavery in Egypt, gave her commandments, her ketubah, her marriage document. She had the purity of a bride, but she fell away and followed after the lust of her flesh, which led to idolatry. Keep your feet from going unshod and your throat from thirst. But you said, it's hopeless. I have loved foreigners and after them I will go. As a thief is shamed when caught, so the house of Israel will be shamed. They, their kings, their officials, their priests, and their prophets, who say to a tree, You are my father, and to a stone, You gave me birth. For they have turned their back to me, and not their face. But in the time of their trouble they say, Arise and save us. But where are your gods that you have made for yourself? Let them arise if they can save you in your time of trouble. For as many as your cities are your gods, O Judah. Verses 25-28 through 28. 
because they see their sins as benefiting their flesh, they are unwilling to abandon them. They should not expect Adonai to rescue them when they have abandoned Adonai. If only from now you would call me my father, you are the master of my youth. Jeremiah 3, 4, and that's the translation from the art scroll. Adonai is pleading with his children if they would only realize who they really are and call upon him as Abba, their father, because a good father will never abandon their child. He will chasten them, but will never forsake them. We wait for Yeshua to come and to collect us, his children, his bride, from the four corners of the earth. We await the day that our fast days will become seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. I pray this teaching has been edifying. Let's lift up the name of the Holy One with love and echad. Shalom. Shalom.